is uh, Monsignor Pope, and today is the 15th of August, but uh, no, normally a, a Sunday in or ordinary time, but this particular year, the August 15th, is the Feast of Our Lady, um, falls on a Sunday, the Feast of the Assumption of Our Lady. And so I'd like to look at this feast in kind of three ways. I mean, first of all, that it's explained, that, it will exemplif that it's exemplified, and then it's extended, because uh, Mary's feast is our feast too. Um, what she receives um, in a kind of a prevenient way, we will one day also receive in that great getting up morning when the trumpet shall sound and our bodies will be restored to our souls. So we'll look at all this uh, just now. First of all, just to explain it, the word assume doesn't, we don't just assume Mary's in heaven, but the idea is that to be assumed means to be taken up. Uh, now notice again the, the passive quality of that. Jesus ascends uh, by his own power as God. But Mary, because she's human, the creature needs to be taken up. Uh, so she's a taken up by the Lord uh, to heaven. Notice again, not just in her soul, but also her body. And um, this has been our teaching. Now you say, well, where's that in the Bible? Well, I'll give you some biblical references. But at the end of the day, let's remember that the Catholic Church is actually older than the Bible, at least as we understand the Bible with the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? So our memory for this goes back, you know, long before. Not every belief we have is recorded there, although it's, it's in conformity with the Scriptures. It does not contradict the Scriptures. Uh, not every event, every detail that we remember as a church is absolutely always recorded there, all right? Now, with that in mind, um, we again want to just say that Mary, when she's completed her earthly sojourn, uh, died. Now the question is, did she die? Um, as most theologians believe, and then her, uh, her body was taken up, or was she simply taken up without dying? And um, it, it seems um, most fitting that she, like her son, although not having original sin didn't deserve the penalty of death, would imitate her son who, who, choose, who chose to accept death uh, in, and, um, in order to save us. Now, um, Mary doesn't choose it to save us, but rather in imitation of her son. So this is, again, there are two traditions, you know, one of which is, again, that uh, she was simply taken up body and soul. She did not see any, any physical death. However, um, um, that's the minority opinion, generally speaking. Most did say she did die, and then after this, her soul was taken up. Now, with that in mind, I have a little icon to show you from the Eastern Church here. Uh, this is a modern representation, representation of a very ancient icon. But you can see that Mary is lying there, uh, having just passed. It is a kind of a very touching thing. The Lord is holding uh, this, that, that her soul in his arms. And um, uh, so the, 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 that, that separation that we call uh, of the body and the soul, which we call death, is, uh, is symbolized here by Jesus holding Mary's soul uh, in his arms. And he will later then take her body. Uh, to heaven. So it may be true that she was placed in a tomb, but eventually that tomb was found to be empty. There is a tomb in Jerusalem uh, that is said to be Mary's tomb, but the body is empty, and there are no relics or any of these kinds of things of Mary's body um, uh, to be found among the faithful, all right? So this is a very ancient teaching, and um, it was solemnly declared a dogma back in the 50s, but it had always been believed. Okay, so that's explained. This is, we want to explain the teaching. Now, exemplified. That's to say, we see that though the event itself is not recorded in the scriptures, that we have exemplifications or examples of this, um, of assumption in the Bible. Now, is it exactly the same as Mary's assumption? Well, I don't know, but I, I, I think there's something probably far more glorious about Mary's assumption. But nevertheless, let's, let's just notice that Enoch uh, in the Old Testament um, was, um, it, it says this regarding in the book of Genesis in the fifth chapter that Enoch walked with God and he was no more because God took him away. And then the uh, letter to the Hebrews sort of elaborates on this. Um, it says that um, by faith Enoch was taken up. That's that word again, assumption. He was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. All right, so we see that Enoch was uh, an example of an assumption. 
being taken up, uh, body and soul. Now, the second example we have is of Elijah, and that's more familiar or more, more well known to most uh, most of us. Um, it says here that you know he's he's walking along with Elisha, and as it says here, this is from Second Kings in the second chapter. And as they still went on and talked, behold, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, and he was seen no more. Now, some traditions also say that Moses was taken up, um, not just in his soul, but in his body, as were Enoch and Elijah, all right, taken up body and soul. Um, some say so that Moses, too, um, so we see that in Deuteronomy, it is said of Moses that uh, when he died, he says he was buried, and um, he, he was buried uh, in, in Moab, in the valley opposite Beth Peor. But to this day, no one knows where his grave is. Okay, That's Deuteronomy. But we also read in the letter of Jude from the New Testament, we read, it hints at the fact that the body was taken up. It says here, uh, but even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil, about the body of Moses uh, did not revile him. So there was some some attempt to dispute between uh, Satan and St. Michael about taking Moses' body. Uh, and um, so does this mean he was assumed? We don't absolutely know this, but it is a tradition. And there's an ancient uh, work called The Assumption of Moses and, and so on. So we, we, we see that this is also there. Now, again, as I say, the historical event of Mary's assumption is not recorded in the scripture, but her presence in heaven, not just in a spiritual, you know, in her soul, but in also her, uh, her body is, is, is certainly hinted at in the book of Revelation from 11 and into 12. And so here's what um, John says, as he writes in the book of Revelation. He says, um, then God's temple in heaven was opened. And within his temple was seen the Ark of his Covenant. And there came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. So he sees the Ark in heaven. Now, if you look at the Old Testament, I don't have time to develop it all here, but on my uh, written or blog post version, I have a link to another article I wrote about how Mary, the, the, uh, the language of the Ark of the Covenant is used for Mary. Um, and she's frequently, you know, in several places in the New Testament, you see that language used for the Ark of the Covenant is applied to Mary. So, for example, like when Elizabeth says, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? That echoes David's words about the Ark. Who am I that the Ark of the Lord should come to me? So what was the Ark of the Lord? It was when that box, if you will, of acacia wood covered in gold, with the angels over uh, over the top, and it, it's, uh, it was said to carry the presence of God in Israel, which is exactly what Mary does in her womb and later in her arms. She carries the very presence of God in Israel. So we, we see here a, uh, uh, that, uh, so John now, he said, notice again, he looks up into heaven and he sees the Ark of the Covenant. Now this is the lost Ark. You know, when the temple was rebuilt in, in well, it was destroyed in 587, and it was rebuilt some 80 years later, but the ark was missing. Nobody knew where it was. And now John suddenly sees it. John, tell us more. Oh, he says, well, there was peals of thunder and all kinds of thunder and lightning and an earthquake and so on. And then, and then he, it seems like he diverts and talks about something else. But I would argue, as many do, that he's really still talking about the ark. How does he describe this ark? Indeed, a great and wondrous sign appeared in the heavens. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars about her head. Uh, she was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. And it goes on to say that she would you know, give birth to a son who was destined to rule the nations with an iron rod. That can only be Jesus, of course. And so the woman is Mary. Now she also represents, I think, you know, ancient Israel. She's an image for the church. But at the end of the day, historically, this is Mary. So John sees the ark in heaven and yet describes the ark as Mary. Now, it pertains to Mary to be, um, first and foremost, the ark in the physical sense, in that she carries the presence of God. Uh, certainly, spiritually, her soul magnifies the Lord, but clearly, when we speak of Mary being the ark of the new covenant, uh, that, that's a certainly a, a reference to her body as well as her soul. And where does John see this body? 
Where does he see this ark, this body, described as Mary? In heaven. All right. So again, uh, this is not scriptural proofs, but it, 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 what it is, is that just to show that our teaching is not out of conformity with scripture, we see three examples of, uh, of assumptions. We see Mary um, also uh, being at least hinted at that uh, Mary is, is in heaven, uh, not just in her soul, but in her body, in the book of Revelation. All right. So, with that in mind, um, this is what we might say we see the, the teaching explained, okay? Mary's taken up body and soul into heaven. And like us who, when we die, our souls go to heaven, but our body rests in the earth until that, that last day when the trumpet shall sound. Now, then, so we see that it's exempl uh, exemplified as well in several Old Testament and one New Testament text. All right. And that leads us then to the last thing, uh, which is extended. See, in a way, Mary's feast is our feast, because I've already said to you, um, there's going to be a great rising of our bodies one day. Um, our bodies, too, will rise uh, at the last trumpet. So as we die now, our souls go before God, and we were judged, and we pray we, we enter into heaven, maybe through, through purgatory, but we get there, and uh, thanks be to God. But our bodies still rest in the earth. But in that great getting up morning, as the old spiritual says, our bodies will rise. Um, and um, this is mysterious because, again, you know, we can all think of possibilities that not all of our graves will be intact. Uh, some people, you know, their body is never found, you know, and so on. But it's not, God's not going to be looking around for my right tibia or something. I hope you understand. We shouldn't just turn this into a simplistic sense that God's going to have to find the very exact dust and, and, and rebuild it into us. It will be truly our bodies, but it, 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 but gloriously transformed into the pattern of Jesus' own glorified body, which we'll look at in a moment. So what we see is that um, our bodies will rise. So what, what Mary receives in a kind of a pervenient or uh, sort of an introductory way will be given to us one day as well. Now, what would this, I don't know about you, but if, if my body has to rise, I'm, I'm looking for an improved model, one that doesn't lose its hair and doesn't gain weight. I just drive by a McDonald's and I gain weight. I don't even have to eat the food, you know? So <clears throat> we have, um, we have a, um, we all have, you know, some concerns for our body. If it has to rise, I hope it doesn't creak like this one does. So, um, but again, yes, it says here in 1 Corinthians, right, that our body will truly rise. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, <clears throat> For we shall all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. For the perishable must, the perishable must clothe itself with, uh, with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with Im the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, the saying that was written long ago, will come true. Oh, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, oh, death is your victory? Where, oh, death is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this, this is taught to us that uh, at the last day, the trumpet shall sound and our bodies will come forth. But now, <clears throat> what will be, I don't have time to develop the full qualities of the resurrection body. Once again, on my blog, you know, you can, um, you can go there, and I have a couple articles on what will our resurrected bodies be like, okay? But let's at least take some scriptures here to understand this in a quick way, all right? So it, 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 it will be our body, but somehow gloriously transformed. It says here, Philippians chapter 3, and verse 21, that the Lord will take these lowly bodies of ours and transform them after the pattern of his own glorified body. Now, uh, St. Paul develops in so, at some length um, in 1 Corinthians, and it's in the, again in the 15th chapter. Someone, he says here, someone may ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they have? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what, when you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body, as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. So will it be at the resurrection of the dead. The, 
body that is sown is perishable will be raised imperishable. Sown in dishonor, it is raised uh, in, uh, in glory. Sown in weakness, it is raised in power. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we also bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Now, uh, one, one, maybe one other text, for this one from the Old Testament, from Job, where he speaks a bit about the resurrection of the body. Um, so um, Jesus, Job says this, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God, and I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another's. So again, this teaching that our bodies will rise. But remember, they'll be risen, raised, but, but gloriously transformed after the pattern of the Lord's glorified body. So just <laughs> to bring this to a kind of a conclusion, I mean, I, I try to keep these videos, you know, kind of more brief and to the point. But I will just say, look, um, it's, it's going to be glorious. You know, some people today, I think, don't really understand the glory of the, the, the fact that our bodies will rise. You see, it's the glory of the human person to unite two orders of creation, the material and the spiritual. And what, what we, this is our glory. Angels don't do that. They're pure spirit. Animals, of course, are matter, but they don't have immortal or rational, anyway, souls. But we, we truly unite both orders of creation. And this is our glory. And uh, our bodies are, are glorious. And they're, they're part of, you know, not just part, but they are who we are. All right? We are uh, both soul, or if you will, a rational soul, uh, soul and body. And, and it's, it's, it's together. And um, so it's our nature then to rise. But again, our bodies, which are weakened by sin, you know, from original sin, will be truly our bodies, but gloriously transformed. So there's an old <laughs> spiritual about that great getting up morning, uh, and I want to read some lines from that maybe as a way to just celebrate and conclude this uh, this little um, online homily. It, it, it simply says, and it's so creative, I, just these old spirituals, but of all the old spirituals, I think this is the most creative of all. Um, you know, it says, you know, in that great getting up morning, fare you well, fare you well, and that's how the melody goes, but here's the words. I'm going to tell you about the coming of the judgment. Fare you well, fare you well. There's a better day of coming in that great getting up morning. Fare you well. Oh, preacher, fold your Bible for the last souls converted. Oh, blow your trumpet, Gabriel. Lord, how, law, how, uh, how loud shall I blow it? Blow it right, calm, and easy. Do not alarm my people, but tell them to come to the judgment. For in that great getting up morning, fare you well, fare you well. Do you see them coffins bursting? Do you see the folks rising? Do you see the world on fire? Do you see the stars are falling? Do you see the smoke and lightning? Do you hear the rumbling thunder? Oh, fare you well, poor sinner. Fare you well. Isn't that great? Get up morning. <laughs> fare you well. Fare you well. So you see, Mary's assumptions are a piece too. She has been taken up ahead of time as a kind of a sign to us that this too will be a gift to us. And uh, one day too then, even as our soul will go to God when we die, our bodies too will one day rise. Because the Lord didn't just come to say part of us, you know, our soul, um, but rather the whole of us, body and soul, which is our glory and how we are as human beings. So uh, thank you, Jesus, for saving the whole of me, <laughs> not just part of me. So happy Feast of the Assumption. And remember, Mary's Feast of the Assumption is our feast too. So celebrate. Uh, double desserts today, but only today. All right. God bless you all.